Atoms are everywhere. Too small to see them, but they are there. In fact, so many of them that stars on the night sky pale in comparison. Everything you can touch is made of atoms. Even you. But what really are atoms? Let's start with a simple analogy. Take this apple. We can cut it in half, then again in half, and again. Keep cutting and our apple gets smaller and smaller. There are two options. We can cut it infinitely or we get to a point where it is impossible to cut more. In theory, we get this uncuttable thing or atomos from Greek. That is where this idea came to be. But to actually observe it, thousands of years had to pass. Around 1804, English chemist John Dalton devised a theory called Law of Multiple Proportions. It states that two elements can combine in whole number ratios to form compounds. For example, he took two iron oxides, iron 2 oxide and iron 3 oxide, and measured how many grams of oxygen is in 100 grams of compound, 28 grams in a first one and 42 grams in a second one. 28 and 42 form a ratio of 2 to 3. And when we look at chemical formulas, it is true. So he speculated that compounds are made of set amount of invisible particles, atoms. Next, we have a model of atom called Plum Pudding Model, devised by, you guessed it, British scientist J.J. Thomson. It takes into account existence of electrons, negatively charged particles, and since atoms have no net electric charge, there has to be some positive charge counteracting electrons. So negative electrons are like plumes, surrounded by a positively charged pudding field. Around 1910, Rutherford, Geiger and Marsden performed series of experiments leading to a discovery of nucleus. Instead of positive energy field, positive charge of an atom is concentrated in a small fraction of its volume, presumably at the center. In short, they shoot alpha particles at various thin metal foils. If atoms were consistent with the plum pudding model, all particles should go through them, but instead some particles seem to scatter when passing through foil. This led to a conclusion that there is a concentration of positive charge at the center of atom, in a tiny point which they called nucleus. Then, few years later, in 1913, Bohr and Rutherford created the most widely known model of atom, the Bohr model. At the center, we have a tiny and dense nucleus, surrounded by electrons moving in orbits, with fixed sizes and energies, similar to our solar system. But instead of gravity, it is bound by electrostatic force. It is interesting how they got to this conclusion. You see, in some cases, electrons can move between orbits, and when moving from a higher energy orbit to a lower, they emit energy in form of light. It can be observed, and each element has has its own spectrum, which corresponds with amount of electrons and their energy release during transition. Amount of energy is constant and suggests that electrons occupy stable orbits. This allows us, for example, to study composition of celestial bodies located light years away from us by studying their emission spectrums. But it couldn't be that simple and quantum theory had to complicate everything. In the 1920s, Schrödinger, the ultimate cat guy, said, what if electron isn't a point? but a wave. So which is it? Well, it depends. There is this entire concept of wave-particle duality, which deserves its own video. What is important to atomic theory is that electrons, instead of being at fixed orbits, are now in clouds of probability, or orbitals. We don't exactly know where, we don't know exactly when, but we know they are there. Well, probably. Probably more there than there, but they are there. Trust me, bro. Well, I know for sure that you should subscribe and like this video. Yeah, anyway, quantum model is complicated and explaining more about atoms using it would be counterproductive. That's why we are going to use the Bohr model, because that is what majority of us learned in school and it is good enough for our needs. Atoms. Those little bastards make up almost everything. Steel, atoms, water, atoms, air, atoms, apple, atoms, you, you've guessed it, atoms. But how? Are you an apple? You are made from the same thing, right? Well, kind of. In basic terms, atoms follow the same pattern. They are not really indivisible as the name suggests. Atoms are made of subatomic particles. We have protons, neutrons, 
and electrons. Protons are positively charged, reside in nucleus of atom and have a mass of 1u, which is around 1.67 times 10 to the power of minus 27. Neutrons, without charge, also in nucleus and also with a mass of 1u, and electrons, negatively charged, in probability cloud around nucleus and with mass roughly 2000 smaller than 1u. This makes atoms neutrally charged and most of their mass is located at the center, in nucleus. Let's take hydrogen, first element in periodic table, one proton in nucleus, one electron around it, for simplicity on the first orbit. There are isotopes of it containing more neutrons in nucleus, but we won't get into that. For one proton we have one electron, so net charge is equal to zero, that is common in all atoms. Now let's compare it to a carbon atom. It is sixth in periodic table, contains six protons, six neutrons and six electrons. Two electrons electrons at the inner orbit, 4 on the outer orbit. Net charge equal to zero, as in hydrogen. So only difference is how many protons, neutrons and electrons are there. On a basic level that is it. What matters is what kind of atoms are in things, how many are there and what kind of bonds they form with other atoms. What if I told you that once you were a star? I'm not saying that you are not a star now, but hear me out. We think that there was a time when all atoms were hydrogen atoms. After the Big Bang, universe was filled with them. Over long periods of time, they congregated and later formed massive stars. Extreme forces smashed them together and in a process called nuclear fusion created new heavier elements. Those stars aged and exploded, sending their ashes through space and by some chance found a way to you and all of us, because we are made from those elements created in hearts of long gone stars. We are mainly made of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen and calcium. Those elements are usually present as compounds, for example water. It contains two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, bound by covalent bond. Do you remember that electrons are on orbits? Each orbit can have set amount of electrons. First maximum of two, second maximum of eight, then 18 and so on so on. Last orbit is called valence shell and electrons on this shell want to reach maximum amount. So if we get two or more atoms with free spaces on those outmost shells, they form a bond sharing some electrons. In water molecule hydrogen wants to get one additional electron and oxygen wants two, so they share, forming water or H2O. And that is in short how majority of compounds form. There are other kinds of chemical bonds, but we won't bother with them. So we can say that most of the matter is made of some mixture of compounds and atoms. But what makes water a water? Or ice or steam? Even though matter is made of atoms, most of its volume is just an empty space. Take hydrogen and say that we size it up. Nucleus is now as big as our sun. Its electron would be outside solar system, six times the distance from sun to Pluto. So more than 99.99% .99 is empty. In your body are around 7 times 10 to the power of 27 atoms. But if we would compress them to remove all empty spaces, you would fit into cube smaller in a size than diameter of a hair. Or entire humanity could fit into a teaspoon. This raises a couple of questions. If it is mostly empty space, then why things don't face through each other? Why we can touch things? And what holds atoms in our body together? The answer is electromagnetic force and its interaction between atoms. Basically, particles with the same charges repel each other and particles with different charges attract each other. Atoms as a whole are neutrally charged. Let's say we have two of the same atom. At some point there is probability that electrons of one atom will congregate at one side. It will create a concentration of charge. So negatively charged electrons of next atom will be pulled to the slightly more positively charged side of our first atom. Then two atoms start to move closer, to a point where repulsion kicks in, then they move apart. And later, by a chance, this process can occur again, but there are billions of atoms next to each other. So this interaction and movement happens constantly. This force 
holds everything together. It forms a field, fixing atoms in place, and in grand scheme of things, allowing for two fields to interact with each other. So, when sitting on a chair, electromagnetic force created by atoms in your butt interact with electromagnetic force of atoms in chair, repelling each other and allowing you to sit on it. Depending on amount of atoms, their energy and movement, matter can change its state, like ice is water with chemical compounds closer together and moving less. Liquid water has atoms more spread apart, allowing for more wiggle room, and steam has even fewer atoms congregated in one spot, with more erratic movements. And that is more or less how atoms make up everything around us. Well, there are a lot of interesting topics regarding atoms that I only mentioned or touched upon in this video. The entire quantum side of things, with its complicated probabilities, wave-like behaviors, quantum tunneling and weird energy interactions. There are very strong forces holding nucleus together, connected to nuclear energy, nuclear fusion and nuclear explosions. Legalize nuclear bomb. Also, we have subatomic particles, quarks, bosons, and other mind-boggling and borderline fantasy stuff. At some point, going smaller and smaller, we can reach Planck's number, at which our theories about how reality works start to break apart. The closer we come to cutting-edge scientific discoveries, the more complicated our world becomes, and atoms are just a small piece of a puzzle. Let's sum up some things. Atoms can be found in almost everything. There are billions and billions of them in things around us. They are made of elementary blocks like protons, neutrons and electrons. Only difference is how many are there and where are they located. Most of it is just an empty space. But atoms can form compounds through chemical bonds and interact with each other through electromagnetic force. That's how they make up matter. In reality, it is a bit more complicated. But I hope that I managed to explain basics of how atoms work. Check out my other videos, like this one about fourth dimension and what could it be. If you haven't done this yet, subscribe and leave a like. It helps to provide you new and better videos. If you would like to share some other interesting things about this topic. See you in the next video.